and welcome to Chandler Science, AP Physics 1, Impulse and Momentum. In today's lesson, we're going to learn about impulse, what it is, what it means, how to calculate it, and momentum, what it is, what it means, how to calculate it, and what these things are used for and how they can apply to the real world. If you are one of my students in my class, don't forget you're going to take your notes, and of course you're going to ask uh, one question in the discussion forum and then respond to at least one question in the discussion forums uh, online. Um, so with that being said, let's uh, dive right into impulse and momentum. We're going to start, start our discussion with impulse. But before we talk about what it is exactly, let's go back a little bit and recap some stuff we've learned before. Um, you may remember, hopefully, uh, that we once said that force and velocity are not related to each other, right? If an object is going, you know, let's say 10,000 meters a second, um, do you know what the force on it is? Not really. You don't. There's no way to know what the force is just by me telling you the velocity. Um, the, the net force could be zero because it's going at a constant speed. The net force could be some very large number because it's continuing to accelerate, or it could be a very large number if it's slowing down. Uh, there's no way to know what the force is on an object just because you know its, uh, you know its velocity. So, um, is there a way that we can kind of um, relate these two things together, like via an, an intermediary, like maybe acceleration? Um, so let's take a look at acceleration. Acceleration is a change in velocity. We have two equations for acceleration. Um, first, we have Newton's second law, of course. We have acceleration equal to the force, net force, over the mass of an object. And we also have acceleration being uh, the change in velocity, v minus v naught over time. Now, what were to happen if we were to set these equations equal to each other? And so both acceleration, right? So let's do that. Let's see what happens. We get f over m equals v minus v naught over t. Let's rearrange this and see what happens. Well, I'm going to get times t both sides and times m both sides. So these t's will cancel. And then I'll do times m, the same thing. It's an m. <laughs> Must be an m here. There we go. And uh, these m's will cancel. And we're going to get ft equals the change in velocity v minus v naught times m. Okay, so what we're saying is that the force times the time is equal to the mass times the change velocity, right? Um, well, this is actually what we call impulse. Impulse. Uh, it's called an impulse force, actually. Uh, it's a, you know, maybe it's a more official name. What that means is, um, up until this time, we've only really discussed instantaneous forces, right? We never said I'm going to push a box for two seconds and then I'm going to let go, or I'm going to, you know punch the wall and it's going to have and make the force be in contact with my fist will be in contact with in contact with the wall for 0.2 seconds or anything like that right it was just an instantaneous force or we would say we apply a constant force you know for a certain amount of time but you know the time wasn't really super important um, well now time is going to be important okay so impulse is how long a force is applied over a given amount of time okay um, and this is one equation that's going to uh, be relevant to us. So we're going to want to know this equation. Now this equation, I believe, actually I'm not sure if it is or isn't on your formula sheet right now, but you can look it up and see if it is. Um, so an impulse force is generally a, a large force as exerted over a small amount of time. So for, as an example, let me show you a quick little video of like a, a, a object being, having a force applied to it, uh, that changes its velocity quite a bit. Um, at a very small amount of time. So here's a video of a tennis ball um, being hit by a racket, and you can see that it's uh, when it's in contact, it's, it's going to go again, super slow motion here. So you notice that as the ball is kind of it's falling down, and um, the ball actually compresses when the racket and the ball are in contact. You'll notice that the ball kind of squishes a little bit there, and the racket gets pushed back a little bit, and then the ball squishes. And then the racket pushes the ball forward. So the whole time it's applying its impulse force, right? And then the ball finally starts to move forward. And then it, it regains its shape. It decompresses back into its original shape. It looks a little elongated there initially. And then it's going to go back into its, its restorative force. We'll bring it back into its you know, spherical shape. And now the ball is going to have a large velocity to the right, right? So the, the change in velocity of that tennis ball uh, happened because of the force, the impulse force applied by that racket. Now the amount of time this happens is very small, right? 
maybe not have, maybe you've never played tennis before, but if you hit a ball with a racket, that's it's a very fast thing happens, right? It's a very small amount of time. It's less than a second. It's fractions of a second. Um, but you get quite a large change in velocity of the um, of the ball. So that's one example of an impulse force. Uh, so let's uh, move on to the next slide, and we'll talk more about impulse. So if I replace if if delta p is ft, right? The, Delta P is a symbol for impulse, but FT is also impulse. So they equal each other, right? So we can say Delta P equals FT. So there's two out of the three equations. Now the final equation we're gonna have um, is just kinda gonna combine these two, right? We're gonna say Delta P equals M Delta V, V minus V naught, right? So these are our three impulse equations. Um, delta P is the official symbol for impulse. Now you might be wondering, well, if delta means change in and P is like so delta P, change in P, what's the P? Uh, well, hold hold on to your hat, we'll get there, okay? It's momentum, but we'll get there in a minute, okay? Let's keep uh, discussing impulse for a few more seconds. Um, all right, so what? why is impulse important? Why do we wanna study it? Uh, I wanna show you a, another video. This one is gonna be of a car crash. So um, you might be wondering, um, you know, maybe you, hopefully you've never been in a car accident, but many of you probably have, or a couple of you probably have. I've been in a few. Never had my airbag go off, um, but, you know, I'm glad I have an airbag. And let's discuss what airbags do, what, they're, what the point of airbags are. So here's a video, and we'll kind of get into the next next part of the discussion. is going to be about graphs, okay? So we're going to have a uh, force time graph here in a second. All right, but I'm going to, we'll get into that in a minute. Let's watch the video first and come back to the, come back to the graph, okay? So here's a video of a couple cars that are gonna collide. All right, this is from, you know, this is a pretty old video, 2009 Malibu and a 59 Bel Air. They're gonna collide. And let's just kind of watch this video together and talk about what's happening. So here comes the Bel Air, crashes into the Malibu. Um, this is what you call a driver to driver collision. Um, so they're kind of like, they kind of both cars hit each other, you'll see here. Um, half of the front of the car, uh, each half of the front collide head on like this. They're only, you might be thinking they're going really fast. I don't think they're going that fast, maybe 30, 40 miles an hour or something like that. So um, you'll see here as the cars collide, they are both applying a force to one another, right? Newton's third law. And so they're both applying an impulse force, a large force over a small amount of time. Um, is it inside view? Now this is the, the Bel Air view, no airbag, you know, got a seatbelt on, but you know, the, the, the hood, you know, crushes his head. He bashes into the steering wheel. You know, he gets whiplash probably. His head goes back. And then you see a video of the guy in the 2009 Malibu, much more modern car, as an airbag. Uh, you'll notice that the roof doesn't collapse on him. The doors are fairly stable. Um, his head does not hit the steering wheel because of the airbag. It hits that instead, although it does go quite a bit forward. Um, he has a nice, you know, the, the headrest in the back protects him from getting too much whiplash in the back. Um, so all these th all these things are happening. I want to talk about crumple zones as well. So you'll notice that um, the Bel Air, the more modern car, when they collide, um, the car is designed actually to crumple a certain way, right? To have like almost it folds up like an accordion. It's can't really see in the video because it's so fast, but um, it folds up like an accordion. Instead of the Bel Air just shatters, right? You'll notice that all the debris in that video is from the Bel Air, the older car. Okay. Um, so all the debris in that video is from the Bel Air, and it just got pieces flying everywhere. Right? It shatter, it just explodes almost, right? The more modern car, the Malibu, folds up when it when it is some debris, but when it gets in a collision, it has these crumple zones. The car is designed to fold up like an accordion upon impact. So uh, the reason why it does that is to extend the time of the um, of the collision. And why do we want to extend the time of the collision? What's the point of that? Well, um, if you are going to collide with something, okay, like in a car crash, uh, there's a lot of force being applied in a very short amount of, short amount of time, right? So let's say we had a, a collision, and here's time. So you're going along your car. Here you are, very little force, and bam, you have an impact. Let's say you have no airbag, no no uh, you know, seatbelt, but you know, that's, not, that's about it. Um, I hope you have seatbelt on. Oh my gosh, you're definitely dead if you don't have one of those on. And so the impact happens very suddenly, right? Uh, no crumple zones, so your car just kind of explodes in a field of debris. And so, bam, you get all this force all at once. And then hit the force happens, hit the steering wheel, the car explodes, and the force goes away, right? After the collision happens very quickly, and it goes back down to zero pretty much, right? All right, now that's one graph. 
if you have no airbag, no crumple zones, what would happen though if you had a different collision? So let's do this one in uh, the light blue here. Now I'll draw a graph of a collision that might happen if you did have an airbag and crumple zones and a seatbelt and all the different uh, modern safety features of a modern vehicle, which is even better now than in 2009. So all right, you're driving along here and suddenly you get hit by a car. So boom, you get a lot of force, right? And it goes up a lot, it goes up pretty fast, but because the time of impact is now increased because the crumple zones add a few microseconds, it's not a lot, it's microseconds, right? Milliseconds maybe. Um, of time, but because you have those extra bit of time, all right, you don't get that much maximum force. Your airbag cushions your blow a little bit, right? It extends the time of the collision. The, the, the total amount of force is going to be the same for both collisions, but what do you notice about the maximum force? It's lower when you have an airbag and crumple zones and safety features, right? Now, if I, if I did this like scientifically with actual data, the area under these curves would be the same. The total amount of force, the total impulse, force times time, is going to be the same for both graphs. However, in a collision, think about what happens. Let's say you're you're messing around with a friend and you're like shadow boxing, right? Or maybe you're doing real boxing. If you're trying to avoid getting hurt, you know, avoid maximum a lot of force being applied to your head or your body in general. Um, would you rather uh, get hit with 10,000 newtons of force uh, in 0.1 second all at once? Bam, 0.1 second, 10,000 newtons of force. That's a lot, by the way. Give you a concussion for sure. Probably break your jaw. Um, or would you rather have 1,000 newtons of force applied to your, your face or whatever over the course of a full second? So 10,000 newtons in 0.1 second or 1,000 newtons spread out over a whole second? It's the same impulse, isn't it? It's the same impulse force. It's 10,000, you know, uh, or sorry, it's 1,000 newtons over one second or 10,000 newtons in 0.1 seconds. Either way, it's the same impulse, right? Force times time. But what, what's going to feel, you know, much worse to your face? It's going to cause you more injury and more harm. It's going to be that 10,000 newtons in 0.1 seconds, right? Bam, all at once. So that's the whole point of airbags, crumple zones, seat belts. It's not that, uh, you know, it, it, makes you, it, well, the, the way it makes you safer is by extending the time of the collision. It doesn't stop the collision from happening. The collision is going to happen no matter what, right? And once you're in the accident, you can't get out of it. But by extending the time of the collision, it lowers what the maximum force would be because it spreads it out over a larger time, okay? Hope that makes sense. Let's talk about uh, the graph real fast and we'll wrap this slide up. Um, I'm gonna erase this real quick. So a force time graph, now we have a new kind of graph, force time graphs. A force time graph tells us a couple things here. Um, the main thing it tells us is that the area under the curve of a force time graph equals impulse, right? It is force times time, right? So if I have a graph like this, maybe a flat line, uh, and then it stops right here, this area under the curve would be my impulse, okay? Because look, it's force times time, right? And that is what impulse is. Delta P is force times time. So that's uh, going to be important to remember force time of time, impulse, air of the curve of a force time graph. All right, very good. Um, let's go on to the next slide. All right, so we said that impulse was, uh, let's write the equations down again, delta P uh, times M times delta V or V minus V naught. All right, so if delta P is the change of an object's mass time, or sorry, if delta P or impulse is equal to a, an object's mass times its change in velocity, right? Over and that change in velocity has to take place over amount of, over time, right? You know, at, the, at time t equals zero, you have some velocity, and at time t equals five seconds later, you have a different velocity. And the reason why your velocity has changed is because someone applied an impulse force, right? Okay. Um, but what if you wanted to know the instantaneous mv, right, or the mass times velocity of an object? What do we call and instead of over a period of time, it's change, right? What about in that one instant? Much in the same way that acceleration is the change of an object's velocity. Well, what about if we want to know what it is just in a single moment, right? At once, in one second. Well, then that's just velocity, right? Instead of change in velocity. Uh, well, in this case, um, an object's mass times its velocity, and at, at, at any one moment in time, and at any instant, is called momentum. All right. So momentum is p. It's a symbol for momentum, P. So impulse is delta P. 
Impulse is a change in momentum, okay? So momentum is P equals MV, pretty straightforward formula, whereas the change in momentum is M delta V, right? So we just add a little delta in there, or you could, if you want to, if you prefer the way I wrote before, M V minus V naught, okay? So impulse is an object's change in momentum. What was it in the beginning and how did, what is it at the end? Momentum is just what is its mass and its velocity right now in this moment, right? At this second, just right now, okay? Um, it has the same units as impulse, so they have the same units. Units for both of these quantities are kilograms times meters per second, so same units. They are both vectors, okay? So they're both a vector, okay? The direction of the impulse vector, direction, it's going to be equal to the direction of the average force. So if your force is to the right, then the direction of the impulse will be to the right. Okay, The direction of the momentum vector equals the direction of its velocity. All right, so if your velocity is to the left, then the momentum is to the left. Hey everyone, I just wanted to come and uh, interject this little video into the other video because I didn't have time to do some example problems with you before and I wanted, wanted to do that before we wrapped up the, uh, the whole video, uh, the whole lesson. So um, let's do a couple example problems real fast with impulse and momentum and then and then we'll end the video and, uh, and everything will be glorious and happy. Okay, cool. So um, this problem here, we have a two one kilogram stationary cue balls struck by cue sticks. The cues exert the forces shown, which ball has the greater final speed. All right, so they give us two force time graphs. Now remember that a uh, force time graph, force time uh, graph, area under the curve equals the change in momentum or the impulse. Now I, I didn't also, I didn't stress this enough, I think in the other video, uh, the other clip. Um, I really wanna stress the fact that delta P is impulse. It's also change in momentum. So they're the same thing. If I say change in momentum, I mean impulse, and if I say impulse, I mean change in momentum because they are the same thing. Delta P is impulse, and it's change in momentum. I'm probably gonna say change in momentum more often than I say impulse because it just, I don't know, it just makes more sense to me because that's what it is, it's a change in momentum, right? Just like acceleration is a change of velocity, um, impulse is the change in momentum, so I just like to say change in momentum. All right, oh, it's a fly, okay. So let's see who has the greater final speed. All right, um, so we're gonna find, uh, if you're given a force time graph, the first thing you should think of is immediately, okay, wait, this is a force time graph. It, this problem is gonna have to deal with impulse and momentum, right? So I know that the area of the curve is impulse or change in momentum, and that equals my mass times my change in velocity, V minus V naught. It also tells me that I'm a stationary both these balls are stationary initially. That means stationary means they're at rest, right? They have no velocity. So if V naught is zero, so then I'm gonna replace the V naught with a zero, basically this just goes away, right? Because minus zero doesn't do anything. So it's really just delta P equals, in, in this example, because our initial velocity is zero, M times V, right? So what is delta P? Well, delta P is the area of the curve. Well, area of the curve is a rectangle. So we have a base and we have height, base here, height here. Um, now, be careful of your units. The base of this thing is actually in milliseconds. A millisecond is one thousandth of a second, um, right? So that's going to divide by a thousand. It's going to be point. So my impulse here is point oh oh two times a hundred equals my mass, which is just one times my velocity. So point oh oh two times a hundred is point two equals uh, one v. I divide by one. That doesn't do anything, right? Anything divided by one is just itself, so this is gonna be V equals 0.2 for this first graph, let's do the second graph. Now we have a similar looking um, graph here, except it's kind of on its side, instead of being like a tall building like skyscraper, the skyscraper fell over in a sense, and now it's lying on its side. So what you should recognize initially, right away, hopefully, is that, hey, aren't these areas on the curve the same, even though um, the, uh, the shapes are different, the area of the curve is the same? Uh, yeah, so let's just do it real quick, and delta P, Again, is M V minus V naught. V naught here is zero, because uh, it's both stationary again. So this time delta P is 10 times 0 0.02 uh, instead of 0 0.002, because that's 20 milliseconds instead of just two milliseconds. So that's gonna be M times V. So this is 
two again equals one times v, and again we're going to get v equals 0.2. So the lesson here, the answer is both balls have the same final speed, and the lesson here is that if they have the same uh, mass and same initial velocity, and the area of the curve is the same, well they're going to have the same final velocity, right? Because the same impulse is being applied to them, the same change in momentum is being applied to the balls, right? So here's an example we have um, some graphs. Let's do another one. We have a graph. So in this problem, we want to find um, a rubber ball experiences the forces shown in the figure as it bounces off the floor. What is the impulse on the ball? All right, well, again, um, impulse is delta P, and that is the area under the curve of the graph. So uh, what is the it's a triangle this time instead of, instead of rectangle? So remember, the area, area of a triangle is one half the base times the height. So our base is a eight millisecond, again, millisecond. Remember, these, all these collisions that happen in the real world happen very fast. Um, you know, you can't even really tell uh, with the naked eye that any time is passing. So we generally deal in milliseconds and, and microseconds and stuff like that. So be careful with your units on the, on the, y, on the x axis. The area of the curve is going to be one half. Now my base is 0 0.008, it's in milliseconds, times 300. So the area of the curve will be. Let's see, uh, calculator real quick, times 300 divided by 2, and I'm getting, uh, I get that right? Oh, 8. Oh, yeah, I punched it. I knew it. I could tell I did something wrong there. Okay, times 300 divided by 2. All right, so I'm getting 1.2. Hopefully you got the same thing, 1.2. So that's my, that's my answer. My area of the curve is 1.2. Uh, kilograms times meters a second. That's going to be my my impulse for this object. Doesn't matter. Uh, don't know what the mass is of the other rubber ball. We don't care. It's not asking us for the mass. It just wants to know. Hey, what's the um, what's the area the, or what's the impulse? What's the area of the curve? So, uh, in this case, the area of the curve will be 1.2 um, kilograms times meters per second. Alrighty. Uh, what what if we wanted to add on a little question to this problem? What if we want to add on and find out. Hey, what was the average force? that was applied to this ball um, by whatever force it, it is, right? Well, remember that uh, force times time equals delta P, right? Well, we know delta P now, it's 1.2. And we know the time this collision took place in is point, or 0.8 milliseconds or 0 0.008. And that is equal to the force. Now, since the force is changing here, it starts off zero and then it gets larger and then goes back down, this is gonna be the average Force, right or force hat okay so we can find out what the average force was here um, we're just going to divide 1.2 by 0 0.08 right divide both sides by 0 0.08 these guys will cancel and then we're going to get the average force equal to 1.2 and I get 150 newtons so the average force supplied by this um, uh, force whatever it is the floor, the wall, whatever, is 150 newtons. So it's another way, another problem that you might get. They might give you a force time graph like this, they being the AP people or a quiz or a test, give you a force time graph like this and ask you to find the average force applied. Now, if they give you the average force, don't assume it's that's the minute. This 300 right here, right? This here, this 300, that's the maximum force, right? Not the average force. So to find the average force, you would use this equation, FT equals delta P. All right, cool. Let's do one more problem and then we'll. Uh, and we'll uh, wrap it up. Okay, this is probably a little more uh, type of problem you'll see on an exam or on, a, on an AP question. So we get a ball. It's got a mass of 0.25 kilograms. It uh, goes to the right at 1.3 meters a second, strikes a wall, and rebounds to the left at 1.1 meters per second. What is the change in the ball's momentum? Now, again, you see that change in the ball's momentum. You think, okay, that's impulse. That's delta P. What is the impulse delivered to it by the wall? Hmm. What is the change in the ball's momentum? What is the impulse delivered by the wall? Aren't those the same thing? They are the same thing. It's a little redundant here. All right, let's figure it out. So uh, what do we have in this, in, in this case? So we have an initial velocity of, of the ball. We got VI right here. We have a final velocity of the ball. We got VF right here. And we have the mass of the ball. Hmm, all right, well, that's everything, isn't it? So delta P, go up here. Delta P equals my mass times my change in velocity, right? Final minus initial. So I'm going to say delta P is my mass, which is 0.25 
tying my final velocity. Now, direction is super important here, as it always is, right? So I want to do this problem specifically to get in some change in direction. Do not ignore your change in direction. This ball, we're going to call to the right uh, on, the, on the screen. The right is to the positive and to the left is negative. My final velocity of this ball is to the left. It's negative. So we must include that negative sign, guys. Negative 1.1 minus my initial velocity. Now my initial velocity is positive. So it's minus a positive 1.3. Right? So my delta P equals 0 0.25 times a negative 2.4. Right? 1.25 times a negative 2.4 is... I can't do math in my head, so I punch it in my calculator. 0.6. Negative 0.6 kilograms times meters per second. And that is my answer. All right? It's negative because the change in the momentum was to the left, right? Initially, the ball's momentum was to the right, going in a positive direction. But the force delivered by the wall is to the left. And our final velocity is to the left. So the change in momentum or the impulse is going to be in the negative direction or to the left. All right, so it's negative 0.6 and not positive, right? And that's going to make a big, 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 big difference. Okay, if you can't tell, direction is important. It's going to make a big difference in problems that you'll do and everything else going in the future, right? So very good. Those are the most problems I wanted to do with you. Um, so now I'll go back to the little video and we'll wrap it up real quick and I'll say goodbye. Okay. All right, so um, now... That's really all I had to say about momentum for the for the moment. There's a lot more to do with momentum, believe me, a lot more. Um, but now I think uh, you should be watching this video, taking notes, asking questions, answering questions if you're in my class on our discussion forums. We're going to do a laboratory experiment in, in the class. So you should be watching this ahead of time before that uh, lab. Um, so uh, we're going to do a lab with collisions and we're going to come back and have another video uh, later on in the week about how collisions work and how we can use momentum to, to solve collisions and stuff like that. But for now, it's all I had to say about impulse and momentum. So uh, don't forget, take your notes and ask your questions. Enjoy the lab and I'll see you next time. So if you have any questions uh, beyond what you're asking on the forums, email me anytime. Mess with me on your mind. I don't have a life. You are my life. So I'll see you guys in the next video. Adios.